Thank you for inviting me to Athens to talk about something that's important to me, and thank you, Alyssa, for inviting me. Um, I hope to stimulate some interest in research and my specific kind of brand of research, which is clinical research, because I see that every patient deserves that kind of attention. The people that are paying for your services are going to deserve that kind of attention to detail. Um, I'm at Children's Health Care of Atlanta. I've been there 20 years. And we are the biggest craniofacial program in the country. We will see 150 newborns every year with a cleft. That doesn't include all the late identified syndromes that we see. That doesn't include the kids adopted typically from China. There's a group in Atlanta that goes out of the way to adopt girls with clefts from China, giving them a future, because a girl with a cleft in China probably has no future at all. It is, to me, the most rewarding area of speech pathology for a lot of reasons. We follow kids from the time they're infants. Half of the families we see know at 21, 29 weeks that their child has a cleft. If you've seen the new 3D ultrasounds, the 4D ultrasounds, it's a picture of your child. Cleft of the lip is easy to pick up. If the mouth is open, you can see the cleft of the palate. So more than half of our families know. They give it a chance to learn to get educated and kind of know what they're going to get into. We will follow those children from birth until late adolescence. You know, it is a two-generation process to take care of a cleft. Some of the things that we do are time sensitive. In speech, our time sensitivity is way up at the front end. Because if you work with even disordered speech in two and three year olds, you know how much they talk and how well they talk. My goal is that all of our children that we see will have speech just like all their peers, somewhere between three and five years of age. They will have a lip closed, a palate closed, they may need a pharyngoplasty. I'm not going to ask you what a pharyngoplasty is. They may need some direct speech therapy. The first speech, therapy, first speech therapists are the parents in each of these kids. We do a lot of education and empowering the parents to be the best speech pathologist. My, my reward for the parent is to ask them if they're ready to take on a caseload because they're so good at what they do. Um, other things like dentistry, dentistry is with them for life because teeth come and go and come and go. The orthodontist comes in seven, eight, nine years of age, does braces. The surgeon is kind of in and out, closes the lip, closes the palate, maybe do a pharyngoplasty, do a bone graft at seven years of age. If the upper face doesn't grow, because a cleft is a hypoplastic situation. If it goes to the bone, all the bone doesn't form. If it goes to the muscle, all the muscle doesn't form. And sometimes the upper jaw really does not keep up growth with the lower jaw. So there are easy techniques, relatively easy, easy techniques now, surgical techniques to move the whole jaw forward so that the teeth are in line, but the kid has the profile that they should have had. Um, child stopped by today at my office, because they all know where my office is. He's graduating from orthodontics. I remember him this big, he's now like this big. He happened to play Little League. His sister played against my daughters in softball at, at the same park in Atlanta. And for him to stop by with his dad to say, we want to say goodbye for the last time. We don't have to come back for break. We can stop by any time. But to, to see a child like that through two decades of surgery, braces, speech therapy, and that they take the time out of their day to come by and say, hi, I'm done with braces. Say, um, I'm, and he's going to Tennessee too. He's going to uh, study agriculture in Tennessee. Um, those things are really a treat. The, um, they've asked me to talk about some of the current research. So we're going to talk about that first. Then we're going to talk about clinical applications of research. There are bench researchers. I've got some good friends that are bench researchers. They cleft mice, they cleft rabbits, they, you know, they're, they're studying things and they're trying to come up with a, an animal model so they can look at how to do a better bone graft, how to do a better osteotomy, how to do a better lip revision, things like that. Um, but I'm a clinical researcher. 
I study things that have clinical re relevance. And hopefully, I will instill in you to ask the question, why? Why does this happen? How did this happen? What can I do? Is this technique better than that technique? Every patient you see is going to be a single subject research design. I hope you take some courses on single subject research design because you're going to evaluate the patient, you're going to come up with a treatment plan, and after that treatment plan is finished, you're going to reevaluate. Then you might withdraw treatment for a while, and then you're going to reevaluate again. Did that treatment hold up? Did it fall down? Do we need to reinstitute therapy? You are at least going to look at every patient you see with that kind of eye. As you start working, you'll realize the parents deserve it, you realize the child deserves it, but you know who's going to ask for that? Insurance. The people that are paying for your services are really going to want that kind of information. And then we're going to look into the future. And I'm going to share some of the concerns I have, but also some of the bright spots I see in our field. So how did we get there? Each of you, I was where you guys are in, because you're juniors, seniors, okay? I was there in 1968, 68. And my first love was, I always loved speech. I saw a, um, it was an article, I think it was in National Geographic, it was called Visible Speech. And the fact that a machine could write your speech down was just the coolest thing in the world. So my undergraduate was really like geology, I loved rocks. But I kept coming back to speech. So my, my undergraduate major was speech science and then linguistics. And my, actually my bachelor's thesis, because they made us do those back then, even the bachelor's at South Florida, um, was on the evolution of American speech. So I went back to about the time of Christ, uh, 0 AD, and just followed it through the, the, the German language, Old German, and so on. And I thought that was just the coolest thing in the world. My senior year, I was taking speech science courses, my major, and I met a couple of speech pathologists. One name you may know, Larry Leonard, does a lot of work in um, language. He was a year ahead of me at South Florida. He's been the chair at Purdue, where my, young, my oldest daughter is now in nursing. And, and it's going to give me an excuse to go up and knock on his door and just say, you know, thanks for saying this to me. What he said was, is, hey, you like speech science? Now, you ought to look into speech pathology. You, know, you can apply everything you like. You can use all the skills you're developing, all the equipment that you want to have. Um, it'll, and then he said two things that really hit home. It'll be easier to find a job, and he said you'll make more money. So those are the things that really resonated with me. I said, I'll, I'll give it a try. I mean, what the hell speech pathology was at that time. So I went over to the program and got into it. And a lot of the things that they pushed at South Florida, we were the Brahma Bulls when I was there, now they're just the Bulls, um, was guilt. And being Catholic, it's easy to make me feel guilty about stuff. Because they told us what I told you, every subject needs to be measured. The chair uh, Clarence Webb was very Skinnerian. We did more cause-effect studies than you can shake a stick at. I had a little squirrel monkey, which is a whole story in and of itself, that I taught to ring a bell when he wanted a treat. That was my, it, was, it took like two seconds to train him to do that. Uh, but I was a hit when I brought the monkey in, on, on campus. Um, everything we did, there's a cause and effect, you're going to measure it. And a lot of it was just the guilt. But it was also, even back then, you know, in 69, 70, 71, was what is the value of what we're doing? How can we prove our worth to the families, to the child, to the people that are paying for the services? 
is what we're doing credible? You know, if we can show that what we're doing, if we study, you don't want to do a research study to show something. You want to evaluate. You want to study something, see what happens. And if we can show that the outcomes are good with this therapy, you gain credibility. You gain credibility with that family. That family's going to talk to other families. The program develops a reputation in the community, and it just spreads. It just spreads like wildfire. If you don't do a good job, that also spreads. So you'd rather have good news spreading about your services than bad news spreading about your services. I wanted then to go to a school that had tradition. And I had to work my way through school, so pardon me for being a gator. Um, I am now suffering sticker shock because I do have a, a, somebody finishing up freshman year. Uh, I wanted her to come here. She was going to get the Hope Scholarship. Georgia College was good. Kennesaw, great nursing program. Boy, she could have lived at home. It would have been $5,000 a year. Now she chooses Purdue, direct admit nursing program. Um, $42,000 a year out of state, which made tech and Georgia seem really cheap, really, really cheap. Um, I think my last tuition bill I was paying myself was maybe like $279 for a full semester up to 12, 18 hours. Sticker shock, I told you, it's sticker shock. Um, but what we learned there is, is that I had mentors in the craniofacial program and at the VA hospital that were active researchers. And my first job up there was as a research assistant. So I was mentored. I was mentored from the start. It's South Florida. And some of this is just, I, being that I was paying it for myself, I had, to find, I had to follow the money. We had a program where we wrote an essay, and they selected the five best essays, and you got to go to the Mailman Center in Miami. There were five instructors and five students. And that experience really taught me the value of one-on-one -on -one clinical teaching. When I got to University of Florida, it was the same thing. We had one-on-one -on -one contact with our professors at the VA and in the craniofacial program. And that's where I spent my life. I really spent very little time in the clinic campus because I felt like all the action was in the craniofacial program at Shantz Hospital or at the VA hospital, where I was working with people that really developed that my clinical skills, but also clinical research skills. What are we doing? Is it doing any good? Let's study it. Let's study it to figure out what's going on. I also had the opportunity uh, at the University of Florida, another essay, must have been good at essays back then, uh, Joint Committee on Speech Pathology, Audiology, uh, and Pediatric Dentistry. And four of us were selected. And the speech pathologists got to go to dental programs, and the dentists got to go to speech pathology programs. And I was selected to go to Portland. For two weeks, I thought I was going to Portland, Maine. Because I really didn't think there was much life west of the Mississippi. But it turned out to be Portland, Oregon. And I got to work all summer with Robert Blakely, who was just a beautiful person, but also an excellent clinician. And did a lot of research on obturators and how we could use those as substitutes. So it was clinical work. He, I, don't, I always faulted Bob for not documenting as much as they taught me to document at South Florida and Florida. And endoscopes had just come out. And Bob, you need to study this with endoscopy, endoscopy, because it's going to really show you if your obturator reduction program is working. But again, it was one-on-one -on -one kind of training. So the offer to you guys is if you ever want to see what a craniofacial program is like, you're always welcome to come over and shadow and say, is this the kind of life I like? Graduation, I got what I thought was the cream job Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Now, I was raised in Florida. Wasn't born there, but almost. 
July um, is in Gainesville is a swamp. That place is aptly named. It was the hottest, stickiest four years of my life. Um, February is no great shakes. It can be hot and sticky even in February. So I'm packing up a truck, cars on the back of the truck, get up to Lancaster in February. You know what, Pen uh, what uh, Pennsylvania is like in February? No great shakes. It is no great shakes. It is no I woke up, truck full of furniture, no place to live because they said it'd be easy to find a place. Car still on a hitch. No snow tires, by the way. I had no idea what snow tires were. Six inches of snow on the ground. And I'm going, oh, overshot. Overshot. But I got to work there on the right, the guy leaning over the patient is H.K. Cooper. I always consider him my first boss. Uh, his son was working there. His grandson came back from his orthodontic program at Chapel Hill. Um, Mo Mazahari, who's not in that picture, is a world prominent prosthodontist. Those people have been friends with since 75. The other thing about working in craniofacial is not do we get to follow kids. There's a small cadre of kids around the world. So you have friends with like passion from around the world. Um, when the Nile virus broke out, I got emails from uh, Jordan and Japan. They were very worried about the Nile virus in Georgia and was I going to be okay? And I said, yes, we're, we're just fine. Um, but that was a complete research experience. I was there, brought in to work on their longitudinal uh, studies. The dentists were looking at tooth development, arch development with the orthodontist. I was looking at speech development. And it taught me a number of things. Because I'll point out some what we learned from the research. But it taught me I was not a full-time researcher. Some of my best days in Lancaster when Bob Millard, Bob Millard's up in the upper right-hand corner leaning over. When he went on vacation and they needed me to fill in the clinic, I'm going, yes. Because I needed to be able to apply what I learned from the patients in research, but I needed to be able to apply what I learned from research to the patients. But it was three of the coldest years of my life. So I'm going from the hottest, stickiest four years of my life to the coldest three years of my life. And I realized driving back and forth to my family's home in uh, Tampa, somewhere between DC and Atlanta had to be the perfect place to live. And in fact, that's where the, we have the four distinct seasons uh, is right through here. So I was able to get a job at Duke Medical Center. And the position um, was actually developed by Vern Kunze, who was brought down from the University of Washington, to develop a post-master's -gra post graduate program. And it was designed for somebody that had been out practicing for a while, wanted to get a job in an area that they didn't have a lot of training in them, train them so that they could go back and get that job. And it was one-on-one -on -one teaching, me and a fellow. And actually, every six months, I would graduate one. So I followed the medical training paradigm where we would talk about something in the morning, and you'd see patients with that disorder. It was my big complaint about speech pathology, which is why I take practicum students, because I want you to know, you, you do need to know all, all 12 cranial nerves. Yeah, you really need to do what all, all, all those little funny things are in the mouth, because you're going to see a patient that has those funny things, and you need to know the normal process. And the first couple of times you see patients, you're going to say, well, a normal process is like this big. Then after your first year or so, it's this big. And then after you've been practicing for a while, you're, it's big. Normal is really, really big. And what I learned from um, one of the ENTs we work with, Pat Keenan, he had been working 30, 40 years. He was who I worked with with voice patients. And I'd show him something from stroboscopy or something, and I'd say, Sir, Pat would know what this is. And Pat would look at it and say, ah, I've never seen that before. So anytime I tell Kaslin, who came over and talked to you, Kaslin is our current fellow, um, she shows me something, I go, Kaslin, I'm going to tell you what Pat Keenan used to tell me. I have no idea what that is. So let's do some research and figure out what it is. And the first thing she does is, what would you do? If I gave you a term, I know you guys will all do this. You pull up your phone, Google it. 
you guys don't know how lucky you have it. You have never looked at a card index, have you? You, you have never had to do a Medline search in the, in the hospital. You can just do all that stuff online. It's all now, it's in your pocket. Take advantage of all of that. Take advantage of all of that. Um, but at Duke, I got there, and they were doing, and this was going to be a, a research, a teaching, and a clinical position. And they were doing a surgery that was just backwards the way they were doing it. But it was what I had learned at Florida that helped me correct that. We'll talk about that in just a second. But when I walked on campus, and I'm sure the way you felt when you walked on the UGA campus, this is where I want to go to school. We drove, there's a big circle in front of Duke Chapel there on the left. And I'm going, I can work here. So my office in the old Duke Hospital, Duke was built in the 30s to make it look like it was 500 years old, looked at it at Sarah Duke Garden. So if you ever get to Durham, or Durham, it's one syllable, Durham, um, you need to see Duke Chapel, inside of Duke Chapel. My wife and I were married in Duke Chapel. We had the Duke side and the UNC side. She was, on the, she was actually the audiologist on the craniofacial team at UNC. We had Duke Blue or uh, Carolina Blue. And, but I was working with surgeons that were very interested, why isn't this surgery working? So we're able to study it. And we took the success rates, which they had were at 55%. Now, if they just would, which is not good for an elective procedure to stop hypernasality, but if they just would have read in detail the surgeon's reports that they were following, they would have found that his results were only 60%. I'm surprised this stuff was even published. By showing them some things on radiographs, how we could use radiographs to determine where muscle should be transplanted, 93%. 93%. Um, so we established a new evidence base for how to evaluate that single subject. His velopharyngeal mechanism, come up with a treatment plan, and if everything followed true to form as it did with our first study, which only included 55 patients, um, everything would be good. And that has followed true to this day. If you just look at the research, evaluate each patient, what we know about the research, we can fix hypernasality 93% of the time if the surgeon does his job right. Why, why do you leave a place like Duke? 17 years at, at Duke. And it was because a good friend of mine, a surgeon, I knew him from the Club Palate Association, kept bugging me. Can I come down to, do I know anybody like me that, you know, that new computers could do endoscopy, could do all of this stuff? And he said, you know, we are going to be the biggest craniofacial program in the country. We've got more patients. We've got great hospital support. You need to come down and look at it. And I said, okay, one day a month, bring all your tough patients in, and we'll see them. And I got the sense that, all of the, the dentists, the orthodontists, the surgeons, and, I, and myself had the same clinical goals. We wanted to bring in all patients that had craniofacial disorders, bring them in and do a team evaluation. That we wanted, we were able to continue our research into pharyngoplasties to fix hypernasality. And immediately, um, and in Durham, we were sharing like a half million people with UNC, which was 11 miles down the road. In Atlanta, you guys wouldn't remember, but Eggleston and Scottish Rite used to be two different competing hospitals. Well, we merged 15 years ago, so we, we rolled the two biggest craniofacial programs in the city and in the state into one. So immediately our population doubled, which is why we see 150 newborns every year. Um, but just moving like that and having this many patients available, it brought out a, an awareness of, hey, Risky's in Atlanta. He's got a lot of patients. He's got a proven track record, unlike what they told me in my first NIH submission. You can't shoot for the stars the first time and get it, but you know, you'll, you'll get over it. I was young and untro un unproven. You'll all hear that. You'll all hear that. It's a job or something. Um, but you'll become proven. Um, 
and it, it brought the attention of a lot of other researchers, friends that I had known that needed big populations. So now I'm not only doing interesting research, but I have the camaraderie of people from around the country and around the world that have that similar clinical research bent. And then as the hospital developed and they took care of cardiac, they took care of um, with Sibley, they took care of the um, bone marrow transplants and all the hemoc kids um, with the uh, cancer center. Uh, they came to us and said, what can we do for you now? Taking care of the top tier, we knew we were small potatoes compared to them. Um, what can we do? I said, I've been having a hard time finding a PhD that really wants to work as hard as me. Who's crazy as, to work as hard as me. I want to start a fellowship. There are, last time I counted, last time I looked, it was like 22, 2400 students graduating every year with masters. Everyone needs a fellowship. They got to do a CFY. There is no CFY dedicated to craniofacial. If I post this on the Special Interest Group 5 list, the ACPA cleft serve, it's costing us nothing. It's going out to people that know me that are teaching all these students that are graduating. They do the match for me. Find the top students that are interested in craniofacial. We had 70 applications for our position. Every year that number goes up by 10. And, again, and I'm, I'm making a lot of my friends mad because I, don't, I can't take all of the people that they, but Kaslin came to talk to you. She made me put on that nose. Um, Kaslin will get her PhD. So now I'm, I'm back 180 degrees from where I was as a student, one-on-one, -on -one, teaching clinical science, teaching research. Kaslin just got noticed her first paper to the cleft palate only had like five things that they wanted. Uh, changed. So now she's got a refereed journal publication even before she starts her, um, her PhD at East Carolina where she's going to be working with uh, Jamie, 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 who is doing real-time MRI studies of the palate. So you can actually watch the palate move, but you can actually watch all the muscles move. So quickly, what I found at Lancaster is that when we looked at our development of speech and resonance and you did a surgery, they didn't follow. You can fix resonance, but you don't fix articulation. You have to evaluate resonance, belopharyngeal function, nasal air escape separately from articulation. If you've ever worked with a kid with hearing impairment, you put hearing aids on a kid at two, what have you got? You've still got a kid that can now hear. He doesn't know what he's hearing, doesn't have any meaning, and he's still got terrible speech. Same thing happens with cleft. If we don't fix a cleft early, you have a kid who has a good palate function, doesn't know how to use it, and still has terrible speech. The thing we've got to get people away from is looking at chronological age for when they fix a palate, when they do a pharyngoplasty. Dentists don't look at that, they look at dental age. Orthodontists don't look at that, they look at dental age or bone age. Why are speech, or why are surgeons, and maybe it's the surgeons that keep pushing for a chronological age. When's the best age to fix a cleft? When's the best age to do a pharyngoplasty? There isn't one. There isn't one. It depends on where that kid is in his language. In 84, we published a paper on the height of the, the sphincter pharyngoplasty. I'm walking over here for just a second because here's the palate elevating. And you see that little dark area, that's where the air was coming out. And you can see the palate's elevating right there at C1. So I told the surgeon, we need to take muscles from the side of the throat. What is the muscle that is just behind the tonsil? Who knows? You get a free bottle of water at the break. The palate of pharynges, awfully close. That is one of the muscles. Pull that up, swing it, so it makes a bulge right behind the soft palate. So the soft palate has this buttress now. It's got a smaller space 
to close off. But that's what I showed surgeons how to do, and it's just common sense. And how I learned how to do that is beyond the scope of this, but it was from working with a surgeon who is the most common sense person I've ever worked with. Um, in 82, we looked at all the kids at Duke, and it, you, we always stratified by what type of cleft do they have. And what we found is that 30% didn't have a cleft. And that has always been, that's been my mantra since even before then, because I was pretty sure we're going to find something like that. I don't care, this is the clinical ramification, I don't care how normal a palate looks. If speech is coming out of kid's nose, he needs to go to the craniofacial center. 70% of the time when we fix, we do a pharyngoplasty, stop the hypernasality, there's an identifiable cleft, submucous, full cleft, one kind of cleft or another. 30% of the time, the velum is normal. The problem is the pharynx is too big. So 70% of the time, it's a velopharyngeal incompetence. 30% of the time, it's a velopharyngeal incompetence. This drives me nuts with the schools. If I'm talking to 200 speech pathologists who worked in the school, I think I got two kids. This kid has a cleft palate and he's hypernasal. This kid does not have a cleft palate and he's hypernasal. Where do you send the kid that has a cleft palate and is hypernasal? Where would you send them? To a craniofacial program. And that's what they would have answered at the schools. Then you've got this kid over here who doesn't have the cleft that's hypernasal. You know where they send them? Sometimes. But it's because they send them to an ENT, because that's their policy, because they label it a voice disorder. Somebody should be sued over that. Somebody should be sued. And then the ENT only does an oral exam, think he's seen everything, because he doesn't know how to take a radiograph, he doesn't know how to look at one, doesn't know how to evaluate one, sends them back to the schools and says, just more therapy. And then the speech pathologist at school knows there's something wrong. They've been doing therapy. The kid's still hypernasal. But who's the parent going to believe? An MD or an MS? Well, they're going to believe the real doctor. Drives me nuts. Then we looked at, um, Loskin was doing his, um, now, now not only am I mentoring speech pathologists, I'm mentoring dentists and surgeons. He was one of our surgeons. Uh, he's now on the staff at Emory, did his residency with us. And I love working with plastic surgery residents. They are so smart, they are so quick, and they have time on their hands. They can put together stuff faster than, and they can get into the medical records and find stuff. But we looked at all of our kids at Children's, so now we're looking at 290 kids, I think. Confirm, almost 30% do not have a cleft. Then we look back and say, well, what is what are we seeing in kids that have syndromes? Notoriously, if you have, sometimes we'll call it plain old vanilla cleft. There's no other diagnosis other than cleft lip palate. You have one success rate. You have a child that has a cleft lip palate plus a syndrome. Pick one, doesn't matter which one. Success rate always goes down. So remember we talked about 22, Q11.2 deletion. We wanted to pull those out because we've got a huge, we, have the, we're the, we are the southeast center for 22. Sometimes we call it velocardiofacial syndrome, sometimes we call it the George syndrome. That's a whole nother story right there is how they got those two different names. <clears throat> and we found that the um, kids that have 22Q, um, about 10, 15, 20% less successful in doing pharyngoplasty. The results were actually better than I thought. But now when a family comes to us, and we can look at the child and say, in our experience, children with your uh, other children that have the same diagnosis of your child, our success rate is thus and so, thus and so. The current research I'm working on, quality of life, which I didn't think we were going to find anything. We've now done two presentations. We have now enough data on 1,024 kids because we have multiple centers that are contributing to all of this. And this is that camaraderie that we have now. I'm working with friends from around the country. And we're looking at, for the first time, 
What does a child think about their own speech? What does a parent think about their speech? What do I think about their speech? And what does the nasometer, you know, which is a measurement of hypernasality, what does it think about resonance? And you know what? The parent and I always rated the kid's speech much higher, not a little higher, much higher than the child did. And it's changing my whole perspective in evaluating kids. I could become touchy-feely. I could become touchy-feely. The nasometer agreed more with the child than the parent or I did. So now we've got all these other questions going around in our head. Because part of our quality of life, we're also looking at bone graphs. Kids, you know, these lines on your lip are what? The sutures. sutures. So the prolabium comes down, lateral segments come around. And if these don't join, what do you get? Exactly, a cleft. Feel that ridge down the middle of the roof of your mouth? Left and right palatal shelves come together. What you can't see is that there's also some sutures in the front part of the upper jaw, where typically the four front teeth come down with that. So the prolabium, the premaxillary segment, that front piece, all, we have three pieces all come together. Middle part of the nose, middle part of the lip, side parts all come together. Um, what we want to, the, and when that doesn't come together in the gum ridge, you have a cleft of the gum ridge, they pull skin across it, but they have to wait till the cuspid and the lateral incisor are coming in before they can put bone up in there. So typically when we're done, yeah, they've closed the palate, but the only place there's bone is along the gum ridge. I have looked at ratings of how well that bone graft worked. I am good at that. I am much better, and this is what we're finding typically, that when clinicians make decisions or ratings of a graphic image, in this case it's an x-ray, where is there bone, how much bone is there, we do a lot better job than when we try to rate speech. Speech is an enigma. Trying to evaluate speech is an enigma. But it does tell you something about how important instruments are as an adjunct to what you hear. So I hope that got you just a little bit excited. I didn't ask you too many questions. We can entertain. I know we went long, but we can any, entertain any kind of questions that you might have before we take a break. Yes. Microphone. I was just wondering, in the study where you had the children write their own speech, what criteria did they rate that on? Good question. So you heard that. I don't have to repeat it. Um, we had them actually make a couple of different ratings. You know, what they thought about nasality and just overall speech. Somebody has tried to, he's a good friend of mine, he's a ski buddy, Peter Witt, he's out in California, did a study, and he used one... Um, rating scale for the parent, one scale for the kid, and then he asked their peer group. And it was a good first attempt, but the rating scales were all different, and there's no way you can compare them. And some of the things were, speech sounds funny. And I could see where a lay person might look at it like that. But this was the first time, and this scale has been, this is the other thing, this scale has been standardized already. But great question. But yeah, we just, we kept it simple because we know how hard specialists, uh, how bad a time we have in rating speech. So you talked about in schools, the policy is to refer a child who does not have a cleft but does have hypernasality to an ear, nose, throat um, doctor. So. Instead, we should be referring to a craniofacial team. Where should the change be happening there? Should ENTs be learning more about this? Should speech and language pathologists be you know, empowered to refer to a craniofacial team? Where does the change need to happen for us to do that better? That is a great question. When I was at Duke, um, I wrote one letter to the Department of Public Instruction when they were at a point where they were writing policy on when referrals should be made. And I was 
able to show them that any kind of hoarseness should end up going to an ENT. They're the experts. But any type of hyper, hypernasality, nasality, should go to a craniofacial team. They go, oh yeah, that's all it took. When I got to Georgia, I purposely got myself on the public school committee for Gisha. I worked, I went through the entire manual, and they had a great school manual. And I marked, it must have been 200 spots where we needed to change things. You know what's been done? Nada. Not a thing. And as one speech pathologist from uh, Calhoun told me, you're going to have to do it speech pathologist by speech pathologist. The, um, we tried to do this on a more national level. Uh, when I was chair, of spe we were special interest divisions, not special interest groups back then, special interest group five, uh, speech science and craniofacial disorders, and we wrote a position, paper, uh, position statement that I will have in one of the, the upcoming slides. That when you label, because that's the problem, they label hypernasality as a voice disorder. And how a labeling should not be ambiguous. Because when you think of voice disorder, Point to where a voice disorder is, everybody. If you don't get it, where's a voice disorder? Where, the origin of a voice disorder? Yes, exactly. Exactly. And where is the problem with the palate? And the problem with the problem, where's the problem in that decision-making process? It's in the brain. It, and, it's just, and it's just poor teaching. And as I've traveled internationally, too, this is an international problem. And these kids get overlooked. If this were a lecture just on clinical, clinical identification, I would show you the saddest case of a 12-year-old girl that came in with the worst cleft palate speech. One side of the palate was paralyzed. Nobody even knew that. If they just would have looked in her mouth, they would have known that. Velocardial cardiofacial syndrome, just could pick it up from her, and her mother had it, she had it. And um, 12 years of age, five speech pathologists, and finally she got to somebody that had been that one speech pathologist that had been to our courses that we give and said, no, something's, something else is wrong, and got her up to us. So this is my way of two, four, six, eight speech pathologists at a time. And maybe this video will help a lot more to get them interested not only in the research, but in the clinical work that goes behind this. Thank you so much. Great audience. I didn't have to ask too many questions.